You've married your farmer, you've moved to the land, and now you have some questions. Are you concerned about groceries and logistics? How are you going to keep a fully stocked pantry? Are you concerned about education for yourself and your kids, particularly if they're having to do school of the air or distance education? Are you concerned about integrating into the community and how we can break down step by step how to take small steps into integrating into the community we've just moved to? Are you concerned about how to do social activities such as camp drafts, particularly if you haven't done them before or you don't have the setup to do them? Well, guys, today on the farm, we're chatting with Chucky, and this is exactly what we're going to be talking about. And we have lots of tips, tricks, hacks, and advice for you in today's interview. So let's jump straight into it. <laughs> And welcome to the farm. I'm Patrick Williams, the rural mum, and today we're talking. You've married a farmer. Now what? And we're here with Chucky. Welcome, Chucky. Hi. Thanks for having me, Chucky. Uh, yourself, your family, your farm, and how did you get there? Okay, so I am mum to four children, and I'm married to Reevee, and we live up in the Gulf um, on our friend station. It's about 80,000 acres, and we also um, have our own contracting business. Um, so we yeah, base ourselves here, and once it dries out, that's when husband heads off, and the kids and I kind of, um, we like to think we run the show, but yeah, I yeah, pretty much just do the the house and kids. Our, we've got our own horses and, and a few head of cattle of our own as well. And, yeah, we kind of caretake and look after um, everything here the best we can and um, just treat it like home pretty much. Yeah, and husband's backwards and forwards um, helping me where he can. And That's good. And I know every day is different on the farm, particularly – you know, up there with the dry season and the wet season. So tell me a little bit about what your daily routine is like at the moment. So in the wet season, we don't often venture too far. You do take that gamble and it always comes back to bite you. You get bogged or <laughs> stuck somewhere or rained on or whatever. Um, so at the moment, it's um, all the jobs that get put off uh, during the dry season because obviously – as soon as it's dry enough, everyone hits the ground running. Um, this is the time to get things done. So everyone is in the same boat. The wet season, you think, oh, thank goodness you can slow down. But it's all shed jobs. It's all things in the house that you want to get on top of. It's uh, <laughs> all the garden projects that you had in your brain over the dry season. <laughs> You're like, oh, since you've got the skid steer here, can we, like, move this old stump or can we do this? And so, yeah, husband is between doing shed jobs and helping me um, with all my <laughs> grand ideas. Um, so because our contracting business is a lot of yard building, fencing, a lot of rural infrastructure and construction. So uh, husband is a boilermaker by trade. So in the wet season, we often do a lot of fabrication work in the shed. Um, again, other people wanting, now that their you know vehicle might be parked up, they might want a new trail on their ute. So things like that um, is what husband d does as well as um, like we build a big stock crate over the wet. Um, yeah, but mostly... My day is trying to keep the mud out of the house, yeah, and schooling the kids and, yeah, being a hand where I can. But most, yeah, my hands are pretty much tied up most of the day. Yeah, yeah, I can see how they would be. So great amount of information there to unpack. For someone <laughs> who's moving to the farm for the first time, um, how was it adjusting to being on, on that station and any you know, tips, tricks, hacks that you would bring from your own experience to the initial move there? Yeah, okay. So I 
I've grown up on the land, but I have done stints in town. Recently, we we did spend 12 months in town. We thought that the kids were, well, they were vocalising that they were missing out because they wanted to learn dance and they wanted to play footy and I ended up getting roped into coaching my son's footy team and all that chaos of, you know, all the extracurricular activities. So moving to town and then back out to the station, I can wholeheartedly say that the kids are not missing out living out here. Um, if anything, although society might lead you to believe that, you know, your kids are missing out because they're not playing footy at six years old or they're not, you know, dancing by three. <laughs> like, but um, the kids have definitely given me evidence that, living out here I mean the stuff that they get to do they we were originally going back to town but um they dug their heels in and they said it felt like jail because they thought if kids were playing down the street that they could just go down there and play with kids like we would at a camp draft like literally we unload everything unpack everything and then they just find kids and go and play so they thought that you could do that in town as well um but that's not the case <laughs> so i would spend a lot of time trying to rope them back in you have like our front door on the street are two separate places so yeah um i was very disorganized coming back out here i normally um will overstock on groceries and supplies and stuff like that. And so because that transition happened during the wet season, I was not prepared. <laughs> so if there's one thing I can offer, it is go above and beyond with your grocery shops, with your dry stores, um, all the cleaning supplies, the chucks, the everything, <laughs> the spare pair of shoes. Um, there's often been times where we, you know, been met with the situation and I'm like, uh, yep, we don't have any good shoes. Okay, Crocs it is. <laughs> Let's get creative. <laughs> we've got to use what we've got. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but, yeah, we, we do love the wide open spaces. Um, we are 100 k's from one town and 60 from another, um, but they are very, very small towns. So um, you often do have to go to a bigger town, which is – hours away to do your big stock up without breaking the bank <laughs> and how often do you do those stock ups just to not you know break the budget and finding you needing to make those bigger trips probably let's say once a month i think um on average you kind of and then the rest of it is just um keeping your fresh produce up um we are lucky up here because we are about I think it's about four hours from the Atherton Tablelands and um, closer to Cairns. So there are a lot of um, local farmers and, and produce um, places that do supply stuff like, and they put it on the transport trucks to come out this way. So if you get your order in time, it can come to the front gate. Uh, we're not too far from the bitumen here. It's about 10 k's, I think. Um, so yeah, we can do that if we need to. But, yeah, most of the time the, the smaller grocery shops up here will have some fresh produce and stuff that we can and your basics to keep you stocked up um, if you can't um, get to the big shops. Yeah. And putting in that grocery order, what does that look like? Does that look like calling the producer or calling the trucking company? How does that look? So uh, off the top of my head, one place uh, transport um, business they have basically they've got their chosen so IGA Woolworths um, even Liquorland I think I saw on there <laughs> so yeah they have direct kind of contacts to them and then you can put your order through IGA and then that transport business will pick it up and, yeah deliver it to wherever the meeting point you agree on yeah, it's just a little bit more of a more logistical feat than if you were doing Woolies Delivered. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. You just got to think a lot of forward thinking at times, <laughs> depending how many people are going to be here, what's going on. Um, yeah. At the moment, wet season is pretty straightforward. It's, it's just us. But, yeah, as things get busy, you'll be looking at the calendar and being like, okay, I've got to put my order in at this day 
because a week after that we're going to have a big mob of people here for mushroom or whatever something like that yeah 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 absolutely let's take a short break in today's episode to bring you a supportive link for the rural mum community for the podcast and for this youtube channel lifeback australia why choose lifeback lifeback is simple effective and a non-invasive way for to protect to protect those from choking the team at lifeback are experts on choking they have spent years studying choking and helping people and saving lives with the life vac i highly recommend we have one on every farm and station in australia after a choking accident on our farm i've made it my mission to pair with life vac australia to try and make sure that every station and farm has one there is nothing worse than having a loved one a worker or a colleague choking and not being able to clear the airway and having to wait for emergency services with the life vac it is easy to apply easy to use and comes highly recommended for the listeners of the rural mum podcast youtube channel and the series so you've married a farmer now what the life vac australia is offering 15% off by using the discount code rural mum that's 15% off using the rural mum at checkout for life vac australia the link to get your life vac will be in the show notes for this episode now without further ado let's jump back in to today's episode and chuki you mentioned earlier um you know you've got four kids they are of schooling age and you're doing distance education so for those who've moved to the farm for the first time and you know they're starting their family or they're starting to look at oh my gosh my kids are now school age because it comes up so quickly how do you get involved in distant education and how does that work in your household okay so yes i've got four in the classroom yeah from age so we've got one in grade uh, five one in grade four one in grade three and one in prep which is kindergarten for new south wales yeah so basically um there's certain areas that distant ed or school the air uh, will cover um and there is some with some places there might be criteria um to live a certain distance from town or within a certain perimeter uh, i'm not sure how it works for each one yes yeah, so we go through mount isa school of the air and Basically, uh, they have their on-air lessons uh, and then they have set work that I will do one-on-one with them. My daughter in grade five, she's a lot more independent, so I can go over everything and then she can just go and work and I just take over it. But, yeah, we start pretty early, which is good because we finish early. So sometimes in the schoolroom, like, we might get a head start at 730 and their lessons don't start till 8.30, but then we're finished by 1.30, around about there. But, yeah, it's a, it's a lot. We will get a, um, a Gavi to come and help me, but I just wanted to get the schoolroom set up, get the kids in routine, and then get someone in to help me because um, the four is a lot. <laughs> I can imagine. So you're starting, you know, the morning or sometimes around 7.30, you're doing your prep work and your independent learning with each child. And then you said the school day then starts. So how are they interfacing with the school? Is it via laptops? I mean, they probably don't do radio anymore. No, <laughs> no. That was when I did a stint of dissonant. It was radio. But because we were driving, we weren't set up for all that. So we would just punch out our set work and then spend the rest of the time on horses pretty much. <laughs> but, yeah, so um, now uh, the curriculum has changed a lot, obviously, since even when I was a Govy and the Kimberley um, and when I did it myself, it has changed so much due to technology. But they uh, do it via, they've got a laptop each now and they've got their, I've got this big timetable up on the wall um, of their time, what subject it is. So today, Monday, for example, um, Molly and Ned, 8.30, are both on air lessons for English. Then 9.30 will be summer on for English. And then we kind of, we've got smoko blacked out, but it's like 
yeah, it's all over the place when we eat because um, yeah. they're all but yeah, because Willow being the youngest, um, while the others are on their on air lessons, then I'll do some stuff with her, then she'll have her on air lesson. So yeah, it's just through uh, they go through Blackboard Collaborate, which a lot of unis and stuff go through. So it's very straightforward, and then they'll do uh, sometimes they might have an on air book that they might do some writing in but most of it is through OneNote now so they'll be on their on-air lesson the teacher can see and they're filling out their um, answers um, they've learned a technique um, I can't remember what it is maybe con alt h or control h or something where they can use speak to text so that they're not trying to find every <laughs> and yeah they answer their questions on one note and the teacher can monitor them as they go if they need a bit more from them they'll say you know ask a question so that they could add some more detail and it's unreal how it all has changed um but yeah it seems to work really well yeah, that's really good to hear. That's really good to hear. And I know that a lot of um, rural mums out there would love to hear that little bit of a kickstart for them, that nice piece of information to know that that's definitely quite an accessible and well set up system um, to help them on their journey. So, Chuki, you were also talking in your introduction about, you know, your contracting and contracting business um, and hubby being a fabricator. So, during you know, this season, during the year, how do you job lot, make job orders, um, timetabling, how do you fit everything in and how do you keep track of what needs to be done on farm? Yeah, right. Uh, next question? No. <laughs> so basically um, I just printed off the computer just the calendar, just the paper version, and we just write in there with pencil. Um, at this point in the year, um, a lot of it's just wet. It like and so it's like you can't get a start date until you're pretty sure that the wet has tapered off well and truly. But you will have your um, stations that uh, want like they've obviously made the plan. They're just waiting for company approval or the dry to start and we kind of are in limbo until we get the go ahead um so basically we're just a lot of a lot of shed work a lot of boiler making a lot of um doing bits and pieces around the station here so that when it's time everything well not everything's going to get done but majority of stuff that we can as for um yeah it, it, there's so many moving parts on big stations that we kind of roll with <laughs> <laughs> wherever we can get to uh, first and from there normally you've got say if you've got uh, a set of cattle yards to build you, you've got a rough time frame um, but often there are things that do pop up the plans might change uh, they might they may require a shaded area over the race so then that's a little bit more time and that might push the next one back but we, we do our best to try and get things done in a certain amount of time um, and Reevee's really, really good um, at trying to work things around school holidays. Uh, we try to squish in cattle work here during school holidays. doesn't always happen, but that's kind of a rough guide, and he will try and, uh, yeah, work his big jobs around the school holidays so that he can be back here to spend time with the kids and not be racing off to go and do other things, um, which is really good. So that roughly works. We try to work in quarters as well. It doesn't always go that way, but the quarters kind of do run into school holidays more often than not. And, yeah, it, there's nothing really rigid, too rigid. We are trying to, but it's, yeah, again, it, we're not just working in a shed. We are working with other businesses and enterprises and have to move around. Um, what their demands are as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, groceries, we've talked about timetabling, <laughs> we've talked about school of the year. Chuggy has moved, you know, from property to property and from town back to the farm. What would you say would be one of the biggest hurdles of moving to a farm for the first time and what advice would that would you give to someone who is doing that? Yes, yeah, so yes, we have moved to a lot of different properties and been a part of many different communities. So I feel like I do have a leg to stand on when I talk about 
um, moving to new places and what that might feel and look like. Yeah, I kind of I find that the local rural or produce place when you kind of let someone know like oh I've just moved out to X property or whatever they normally do know where you're talking about and yeah I find that's a really good conversation starter yeah same with the local um, service station or um, even the, even the pub like getting to know that's just a way and then yeah people get to know you and um, what you're up to and then that way when things are going on in town someone will often let you know bring the kids in there's a, a pool party happening or whatever and and one thing is I my husband <laughs> he always says how my all I am and how I'm like he's the social butterfly and I love like talking to people and I can like talk and talk and talk but um, I do find that if um, if he's going to town with the kids and I'm like, oh, do I really need to go? But I have to make myself go because otherwise I don't meet anyone and I don't know anyone. So if you do get invited to a barbecue and you, it's the end of the day and you really don't feel like going, um, I do recommend going because you kind of put faces to names um, and, yeah, that's just kind of how it starts, I guess, um, in small communities. I love that you said the small steps to start with of, you know, introducing you to pers- yourself at the service station and introducing, you know, the person the, at the people at the, the produce store or the, you know, where you're getting all your animal products and stuff from. That's fantastic. I love those small steps that really get you started and engaged in the community because sometimes when you move to the farm for the first time and you're looking at going to a community event, sometimes that is so overwhelming. That starting step of just introduce yourself when you're filling up your car or when you're getting your groceries, that's that's awesome. I love that so much. Now let's take a break in today's episode to give a shout out to one of its supportive links. This is Survival First Aid Kits. Thank you to Survival First Aid Kits for coming on board this season and offering a discount code to the Rural Mum viewers and for the series, So You've Married a Farmer, Now What? Survival First Aid Kits are the most responsive first aid kits in Australia. Survival First Aid Kits tick off every item that you need for your first aid kit, offering full compliance for workplace safety. This includes car, sports, snake bites, travel kits and everything in between as this will cover pretty much everything you need on the farm on your basic and comprehensive level. Survival first aid kits are easy to use, colour-coded and can be personalised. Be prepared for your next safety emergency on farm. Have a plan, have the kit and be organised so you can be immersed and prepared for when something may go wrong here on your farm, which we hope doesn't happen. Thank you to Survival First Aid Kits for offering the Rural Mum community and the podcast listeners of So You've Married a Farmer, Now What? a 12% discount on their first aid packs. When purchasing Survival First Aid Kits, use the code RURALMUM12 at checkout to receive the 12% off. Now let's get back into today's episode. Um, So with those community events, you also mentioned that you're right into camp drafting or you go to camp drafts about logistically for you and the kids, (laughs) packing up, getting there (laughs) and then enjoying yourself. Yeah. So anyone who knows me knows how long I've been pushing to get a really big horse set up because I am horse mad and have been our whole lives. Like that's just part of our family blood, so to speak. Um, But we're still... (laughs) So sometimes we might have friends going to a horse event and we can chuck some extra horses on there because all four kids ride. So that's four horses for the kids. And this year it's between six and eight. But the funny part is is we have (laughs) we've had to at times, but this is just how much I'm determined to make it happen because that's literally all like I'm so passionate about it. But... And that's what we do. Like that's our the only thing that we kind of go and do outside of um, working, I guess. Um, so yeah, at the moment 
sometimes I, if husband's working, like I've just put on two horses. Um, I try to take one that my daughter, my eldest daughter, because she's kind of at that age where she really understands the sport of it. I take one that she can ride that's also safe that I can have a run on too and I'm not going to make it too strong or, you know, anything for her. So I try to, yeah, take ones that, yeah, are not going to be too much trouble for the kids and I. But logistically it's a nightmare, I'm not going to lie, but I just I just make it happen because I just, while my horses are not um, set up to the best that I would like them, um, they are enough for me to enjoy. And I just like to, the big thing for me is while it's it's good for the kids to obviously get off the place and spend time with like-minded people, but I just like to see how my horses are going, com- like when I'm competing. I'm a really nervous competitor. So I kind of, everything I practice at home, I'm like, oh, this feels really good. I get in the camp and I freeze. And I'm like, oh, I can't remember what beast I was gonna, like, I just get all, you know. Anyways, um, but yeah, for me, I do like, making myself go getting out of my comfort zone and going because it's just a way for me to like I guess see how my horses are going um out in the ring even if I barely remember what I'm doing because I'm so nervous (laughs) but um yeah there are a lot of people that do help us get all there as a family when we've got all the horses to go and where all six of us are going um yeah people have been really great in helping us get all <laughs> truckload of horses somewhere but yeah hopefully this year <laughs> fingers crossed <laughs> I will have something that we can at least fit all our truckload on in one vehicle yeah fingers crossed for you because I absolutely yeah. love love that yeah you it's a passion you have something not only for you but you can do it with the kids and it's sort of segmented in in that and it's looking after yourself you're clearly very passionate and I love that you're working through the logistics the best that you can and that you're asking for help to get the other horses there and to get all the gear there I love that love that you're doing that and I love hearing that the community around you that you've built is really helpful in that manner as well yeah I I'm sure when when there's a draft coming up and someone sees my husband or I ringing and asking if they're going to a draft, they're like, oh, no, <laughs> we're going to have to take some McCormack horses, I think. <laughs> but yeah, it's always a, like I find that up here, um, actually any like camp drafts you've been to, everyone's been amazing um, at helping. And with the kids' saddlecloth, um, I got them Angus Barrett saddlecloths, which are not cheap, but got their name on there so that if, if the kids are riding around somewhere, I'll be like, have you seen a summer? It's on a saddlecloth, like, so that people can, like, <laughs> direct me where my kids might be. <laughs> that is such a good tip. <laughs> Get their names on <laughs> the saddle blanket so other people can help you look out for them. That's so everything. So, Chucky, we touched on, um, you know, having a passion and having something for yourself that's not just work and kids. So yeah. tell me, I mean, I know that you're so driven and passionate about the horses and that you make it happen. Is there sometimes a s- steps you have to take for that motivation, the same as going to town to join in some of the community community events? Like sometimes it is just so much nicer just to stay home in our own little quiet box while everyone goes out. Yeah. So are there steps or mindsets that you take to make sure that you're still driven to make sure you're going to do those activities? Yeah, I can't, I do this a lot with a lot of things. Um, I use foresight, like how will I feel after going, after the weekend, after that barbecue and actually socialising, getting out of my little bubble here. Um yeah, I kind of think I know I'm going to feel much better after going. Like, and more often than not, I do. Like, I, I hate driving, hate going to town, <laughs> even though I lived in town for a bit. But I still that initial, oh, I've got to go and do this. And then afterwards, I'm like, oh, it was so good to run into such and such and have a quick chat and you know see how their kids are going and you know. And I found out that there was this event going on in town and I jot that in the calendar and it's kind of I guess like humans crave connection and belonging and I have to remind myself of that that you do need to connect with other adults not just the kids 
yeah, otherwise I find that I I talk like the kids. Like I'll say, oh, I took him instead of like, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> if I don't go and socialise with adults, um, it's terrible. <laughs> I can't talk properly. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, Chucky, that comes to sort of questions for today. So, did you have any, any other tips, tricks, advice, or hacks to other rural people moving to the farm for the first time, or even to those who are becoming first time mums on a farm? Um, I think, in the big scheme of things, I think it is what you make of it. And it is important to also be a part of what's happening on the property and in the, keeping in the loop and um, and also keeping in the loop in your community. I think it is good to also find something for yourself that you can pursue, whether that's like a veggie garden. I mean, I listened to one of your podcasts about um, homesteading and I was like, oh, there's so much in that that like I wouldn't, oh, I'm not a very good um, homemaker. I do my best, but I'm, you know, my husband had to teach me how to cook. That's how bad I was. Um, I've come a long way since then, don't worry. But, um, yeah, definitely having your little projects, even, I mean, I've got a sewing machine. I always talk about needing to learn to sew, but if that's something that you could have your little thing on the side um, for your time, yeah, always make sure that you're just trying to do something for yourself. I think that's really, really, really important. Or you'll just lose yourself in the chaos of it all and get to a point where you're just like, what about me? <laughs> I always talk about finding pockets in the day. So, yeah. like, I might have 10 minutes while the kettle's boiling. What am I going to do for me in 10 minutes while the kettle's boiling and everyone's preoccupied? Am I going to do some deep breathing? Am I going to go and, I don't know, put my hair up or replat it all? <laughs> yeah, and, like, I, the horse thing for me, like, it's probably a nightmare for my husband and for everyone else that... <laughs> but I just know how much better I am for it. So I make sure that I, I fight for that and I make it a non-negotiable because that's what I love and I'm not going to um, compromise on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely well worth doing that and great adv advice and tips there. So, Chuggy, we've talked about a huge range of things today. We have covered moving to the farm for the first time. We have talked about grocery stocking and forethought and supply logistics. We've talked about school of the air, educating by distance, um, logistics of going to camp drafts and connecting with our community. I really loved our chat today. I know that I have taken some key points away from it. I know that the other listeners will as well. So thank you so much for being here, for sharing all your knowledge with us. And we hope to see you in the comments of our videos if anyone has any further questions. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us here on the farm with Alex Ladder. I hope that you have picked up some tips, tricks, hacks and advice along the way that will help you move to the farm for the first time. If you have enjoyed the story and enjoy hearing from people who have moved to the farm and who have tips, tricks, advice to give to you about making the transition easier and smoother for you, then please like, subscribe. Also fill out a review or leave a comment below that will help other people find us and the content that could help them about moving to the farm for the first time. We have also opened up sponsorship places for our social media streams as well as this podcast and the YouTube channel. If you are a business that enjoys supporting people moving to the farm, the agricultural industry, and especially women on the land, then please get in touch via the website link in the description and show notes below. And I'd love to have a chat to you about coming on as a season or episode sponsor. If you know a rural mum who has experienced moving to the farm for the first time or across multiple farms with advice to share, then please also nominate them via the website link below. Until next time, thanks guys for joining us here on the farm and we'll see you back here very soon.